Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, I'm honored to have Brian Kurtz. He is executive vice president at Boardroom Inc., which at its height was a $150 million company. He has overseen the mailing of approximately 1.5 billion pieces of direct mail over the past 30 plus years. He's been in the trenches of business, marketing, copywriting, and he has put together an epic event called the Titans of Direct Response with marketing titans such as Dan Kennedy, Greg Ranker, Gary Bansavenga, Jay Abraham, and so many more. Brian, thank you so much for joining me. Oh, I'll join you anytime, anywhere, Jeremy. <laughs> yeah, it's an absolute pleasure to always have you. And Same here. You know, what's you know, this is the Inspired Insider. So what this is a what inspires you series so we can push forward despite adversity. So my big question for you is what do you think about that inspires and motivates you when times get tough so you can push forward? Yeah, so I, I guess I, I was thinking about this because, um, I mean, obviously I've had a 1.5 billion pieces of direct mail. I didn't lick every stamp, by the way. Um, Good. And, you know, that's a lot of ups and downs. You know, it's not all, um, everything's not rosy and all of that. So there's been a lot of successes and failures throughout my career. So I was thinking, and, you know, 2013 was a particularly tough year, and that's kind of recent. So I think I figured let's go for the most recent and because I have so many other things I, 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 could, I could depress you with from my past career, but also inspire you with, I hope. And so 2013, I lost two people, and you know nothing gets worse than death, right? So um, I lost two people in 2013. One was my father-in-law uh, that April, an uh, incredible entrepreneur in the insurance business. He was a beast in the insurance business. Um, you know, obviously, um, always was watching over my shoulder to make sure I was taking good care of his daughter, but we had a great relationship and he just, he, he had a major stroke, dropped dead, total surprise. Sorry to hear that. Uh, yeah, it was Horrible. really tough. And then later that year in October, I lost Marty Edelston, who was the, uh, mentor of mine here at Boardroom. He founded Boardroom. I'm not the bootstrap entrepreneur. I'm the bootstrap entrepreneur who Marty became, uh, made a partner in the business, and, and, but Marty started the business. So I lost both those, those guys in my life, both incredible mentors, incredible role models in entrepreneurship, in business, in everything. It's really and tough, wow. Very tough. And, and so, you know, but I didn't sit and, and feel sorry for myself. I think that's one of the lessons. You know, don't, you know, things are going to go bad, you know, and you have to figure out how you're going to get through that. And, and there's one exercise that I do a lot, and I got it from Dan Sullivan through Strategic Coach, but I've heard different variations of this. You also see it in various journals and things, and it's about gratefulness. It's about you know, making sure that every single day that you're above ground is a good day, and that every day you have to always think about what you're grateful for. So there's a great book called The, um, the Five-Minute Journal, which is a book you can get, on, I think, on Amazon. And the page basically says, you know, at the top it says, every morning you get up and you say three things I'm grateful for, then three things that'll make today great. And then you do some affirmations, and then you're kind of done writing to yourself until the night when you need to do one other thing, which is give yourself three wins a day. And that, that's a, it's a little different in the book. Dan Sullivan talks about this. So... My, my thing is that uh, I remember sitting in hospice with my father-in-law. Um, he had never regained consciousness after a major stroke. I'm sitting with him for two full days. And on both of those days, at the end of those days, after sitting with him all day, I was able to come up with three wins. Now, if I can come up with three wins on a day as I watch my father-in-law pass away in front of me, yeah. and I can come up with win, and I, I, I can talk about Marty too in a second, and now that, that'll lead into my quick thing about Titans, but... With my father-in-law to be able to sit there and come up with wins, and they were they weren't that e they weren't that tough to come up with, because I had been so grateful for so long mm -hmm. about who he was in my life, and he could be a pain. He was my father-in-law, you know. I I, I I was sleeping with his daughter. He can't like me that, <laughs> right? Um, but on the other hand, you know, the the relationship was so deep, and I had I had spent so much time over 28 years of my marriage saying how grateful I was that I had an in, a father-in-law like that. Yeah. So that when it came to me watching him uh, in hospice, I mean, I had things like, you know, I, I, the, the, the kind of provider he was to his, to his kids. And that's the kind of provider I want to be or I am and I'm going to be. Like I was almost promising 
him yeah. while he was unconscious that I was going to do what he did. That was a win. Yeah. That was a win while he's dying. Yeah. Um, he's sitting there dying, and I'm, I'm thinking about you know, how he set up his finances, and everything was about his kids, taking care of his two girls. And then I thought about the grandchildren and the experiences that he had given my kids and, and, my, and my, um, uh, my sister-in-law's kids. And, and one of those kids is handicapped and what he did for them. So all of a sudden, it's like all I'm thinking about are all these. Now, again, you can say it's kind of corny. It says, oh, I'm just thinking about the good memories when he's dying. It was bigger than that. It was like actually on the day he's dying to come up with three wins. Yeah. So that is an exercise that if I can do it on that day, I felt like I could get through almost any day in my life, even though it's tough. Right. But nothing is, is, is as tough as, you know, someone close to you passing away. I don't yeah. Except when you when your own death and right. and and you know you have to think about your own mortality and you have to think about where you are grateful every single day yeah. and if when you stop doing that when I don't write in my journal for like three or four days in a row I realize I fall into some despair and I figure it out I said do I, am I in despair because I didn't brush my teeth this morning because I ate some gluten or because I didn't write down my three things I'm grateful for and right. it's a, it had nothing to do with the gluten. So that's, I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's a, a it, it sounds kind of corny, it sounds yeah, kind of simple, no, but it really is how I would get out of any kind of spiral now, uh, because I know I've gotten out of some biggies. Now with Marty, what happened was, you know, again, I knew he was in decline, so that was more of a longer goodbye, whereas my father-in-law was sudden, so they were very different, but they both happened within, you know, four months of each, five months wow. of each. So when my, when Marty uh, was going, I spent, I was able to spend a lot of time telling him while he was on his deathbed, where he was still somewhat conscious to always remind him what he meant to me. So I was able to express it where I knew he was hearing me, which was really important. Um, but I was still writing. I was still writing about what I was grateful for, what I was doing, all that. And then, you know, this, the perfect storm that happened after he passed away and the outpouring of love, I, I always felt it was like it wasn't serendipitous. Marty, you know, Marty created an incredible life for himself, and and people loved him. But the stuff that came in to my desk and to my email, and you know, and the FedEx letter from Dan Kennedy, which actually inspired me trying to doing this event, this Titans event, which is actually going to be partially a tribute to Marty. The first mm. part of the event is all about Marty Edelston, and a tribute to Marty. So it's like that I was able to create probably the event that Marty and I would have always wanted to create yeah. together. Cause we always wanted to educate the direct marketing community. And now I was going to do it. And it was inspired by him passing. You can say, well, why Brian, why didn't you do it while he was alive? Well, I don't think the perfect storm would have been there. I don't think the, the way it unraveled and the way that it happened because of how I was dealing in, in the context of gratefulness, yeah. in the context of that, I was getting wins even though he was leaving me. And so very, very powerful stuff. And again, I don't know. To me, I just said it and it sounds so simple. Um, but if you don't do well, it... Well, in that situation, fire. it's not. I mean, you're talking about something really, you know, really bad, really tough. Yeah. I, I think I think it's, it, it's, it's easy to also talk about and, you know... Sometimes I don't, I, there are probably things that are less impactful or less uh, devastating than people dying on me. And I take them more to heart because I'm not looking for wins because I'm not living in gratefulness. There's a great expression too. It was the first post I did in my series of weekly email posts that I do every week. And it was on February 14th of this past year, Valentine's Day, Marty's birthday. He had been gone since October, so he was gone for about six months. I decided to start my post that day, his birthday this year. So I used a quote from my one, a guy I know really well, Sean Stevenson, who's a wonderful speaker mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. lecturer. Sean, you know, and he's handicapped and would never tell you he's handicapped. Um, basically, you know, is, is confined to a wheelchair and yet is probably would never trade places with you, would never want you to feel sorry for him. And he has this one line that I used in that first post, which is, I love everybody because as soon as I stop loving you, you own me. And what an amazing thing, right? Because as soon as you start obsessing about the people in your life that you don't like anymore or the situations, oh, woe is me, poor me, 
victim language. If you can stop yourself and say, is this a, a result of me not loving somebody or not loving my life or loving the fact that I'm above ground, I got to stop. I got to stop. I got to catch myself because as soon as I stop loving life, loving you, loving me, um, whatever that is, is going to own me. Yeah. And it's so powerful. So true. Yeah. And, and, I, and again, I have to try, it doesn't happen automatically. If, 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 if I'm making it sound like I'm perfect at this, I am not. You know, I fall into the same despair and the same depressions as any other human being. I get sad. I get every, like anybody else. But the key is how you dig yourself, how you dig out, which I think mm -hmm. was the point of this, yeah. this uh, little mini interview. Yeah. And I think that those techniques, gratefulness, creating wins, even when you're in the worst situation, and just trying to love everybody. And when you stop loving somebody or you stop respecting somebody or someone is eating at you or a situation's eating at you, you must either start loving that person or thing or get out, move out, move out. You got to get used to, you know, so that would be, you know, and again, easier said than done. Sometimes I got it, you yeah. know, don't, don't I don't want to make it sound like it, this is not an easy button, yeah. you know, um, but that's how I do it. And, yeah. and that's how, you know, it, without that, without that technique, I think, I would probably be in a lot more despair and long, for longer periods of time. I, I hate victim language. I hate language that says, when they did this to me, or they did that to me. There's another great expression that I use all the time. There's, there's, a, there's a website called despair.com, which are kind of like goofs on motivational sayings and stuff. Mm -hmm. Just great. They do cards and great stuff. And my favorite one is the one that sits on my desk. It faces out to anybody who walks in my office. And it says, dysfunction, the only consistent feature of all of your dissatisfying relationships is you. So if someone <laughs> right. comes in my office and say, that one did this to me, this one did that to me, that one did that to me, blah, 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 blah. and then I say, okay, there's only one thing that's consistent in all of your problems, and <laughs> it's you. <laughs> you're like, you're in there. You're the star of your own movie. Very so, true. Yeah, so, so all of that. Um, is kind of how I dig out. And the thing is, you, you need to be dug out of that stuff and out of that victim stuff in order to be productive. Because if, you, if, if your mind is being clouded with victim stuff and sadness and despair and depression, which are going to enter in, how are you going to be productive and make your mark and create the legacy you want to create, create the, the world around you that you want to create? So. Yeah. No, I like that. And and kind of on that, Brian, so what are some action steps people should start doing right now based on what's brought you the most success pushing forward? Yeah, th th it's interesting because I had this conversation just recently. I did, a, I did some podcast recently, and I was talking about this idea that the word networking is so overused. And uh, th this is an, a really, really important point. Um, you know, and people always come up to me and say, you know, Brian, how are you? You're so well networked. Everybody knows you. Or, you know, uh, there's no one that doesn't know who Brian, blah, blah, blah. blah. And, and, and the whole thing makes me nauseous when they start talking like that because it didn't just happen. I didn't just like hit accept, accept, accept on my Facebook and my LinkedIn. I didn't just, you know, go out and, you know, shake hands with people at, at you know, at baby namings and, you know, weddings and bar mitzvahs. It just doesn't work like that. What really works is contribution. And so if I had to tell anybody what they should be doing on a daily basis is everything that they do, like today, right now with you, yeah, we're going to, you know, you may be helping me with my event or I may be helping you with content, whatever. But I know I'm contributing to you in some way by doing And everyone and, and else I'm, who's listening. And yeah. everyone else who's listening, yeah. right. So if I start, if you start at contribution, I may get something out of it, but I'm not waiting to see what that's going to be. Right. Like it's not, it's not, I don't keep score. Like I'm not keeping score. Okay. I'm going to do a favor for Jeremy. So I better get one back or I'm going to do six for him. And I only got four back. No. And in fact, I even did a blog post, which I think you commented on, um, specifically cause you're like, I think this. I comment on all your blog posts. <laughs> I know but this one, you were this one, cause this one is about, you're like this too. And I talked about a hundred zero and you were like, that's how you live too. It's like, you don't, you don't do something and then figure out what I'm going to get in return. You do it. You, you, you contribute and I believe in serendipitous stuff, you know, that you put good stuff into the world and you stay in with momentum and you stay in movement yeah. in terms of contribution. And I'll just a little thing like anybody who ever links in with me and I've, I've told a bunch of people this, 
anybody who ever links in with me, the first thing they get from me is an email. Well, what I do is I, I save them up. I get like 30 or 40 every couple of weeks. LinkedIn, more LinkedIn than Facebook, right? So I get all these LinkedIn requests. And what I do is I check out their profile. I look at who they are, who they know, what they do. And I find like the common ground. So like if I saw your, well, let's say I see a copywriter and they say, you know, this guy is a copywriter and he's gone to the uh, AWAI conference. So then I'll send him an email, personal email, not a LinkedIn email, a right. personal email. Cause you can get, if you hit reply, you get their personal email that they've signed up with. And I say, great, great. Thanks for linking in. Um, I see that we're both aligned with AWAI. Uh, hopefully I'll see you at the boot camp. blah, 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 blah. I'm speaking there. Yeah. I give them my website so they can look at my content for free. And now I've just contributed in some way and not just connected. Yeah. And by contributing, I've now connected in a whole different way. And some, some people come right back and try to sell me something because they're an envelope salesman or something. And that's going to happen. Some people will come back and go, you, you send an email to everybody who links in with you. And then some people just say, oh, I've been following you for years, blah, blah, blah. And now I've, I've just made a friend. And, and the level of connection there, even from a stupid LinkedIn request, is so much more at the outset than it would have been if I just hit accept, which right. I could have done. Yeah, it's now so I funny because we do the exact like I will do almost sure the exact do. same thing—a personal email. I I take the time to look through every single person. Yeah, oh, uh, so, yeah. yeah. It's like you know they're human beings, you know, and that that would so to go back to your question: What can people do now? Yeah, you know what? It's like everybody who you come in contact with in the world is a human being with likes, dislikes interests that might be similar to yours, interests that will be different than yours, if there's some reason why you're coming together, to, to not use that as an opportunity to figure out without giving them a lot of, you don't have to give them a, a lot of money right away. You don't have to give them a lot of advice right away, but contribute. Right. We all have something to contribute. And I think once you contribute, that's how you really connect. And to me, that's, if I had to say what, how I look at, I, that's why I don't use the word networking. I, you know, I think this is much bigger than that. So what the advice is that you have to start today thinking about every interaction that you have during the day, and it's a, it's a process. It's not going to happen in one or two days that all of a sudden I'm going to have this incredible group of people around me that would, you know, that, that love me and I love them. It just, you know, you got to build that over right, time. Right. And a lot of people who are listening to this, I know the kind of people that listen to you and the kind of people who you've interviewed are already pretty enlightened on this kind of stuff. So they're probably saying, ah, Brian's just being a little woo-woo here, and that's okay. But I think that being... It helps to being, get some reinforcement on that. Yeah, yeah. contribution, you know, if you... Because it, 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 it's so... It's sort of like... Um, it's sort of like uh, um, compound interest on your money, you know? It, it's not each individual contribution is, is independent. To me, every contribution is... It's like, it's like you're in the bank getting, yeah. getting, getting interest. And whether you cash it in or not... I don't know, you know, they're right. not IOUs. I, I don't, I'm not keeping score, but boy, the stuff that's come back, I can tell you yeah. over 33 years, I wasn't keeping score, but I'm, I'm full. Right. I'm, I'm satiated, yeah. you know, how much I get back from people. And I know it's because of how much I've contributed. Yeah. Is it, is it more or less? Does it matter? In fact, I think in that hundred zero post, my, I think I started with, I've never, I don't, the, the concept of meeting me halfway is not a part of my vocabulary and hasn't been my entire adult life. You never have to meet me halfway. Yeah. And, and, and I think I use the example of my high school friends who were really lame. And, you know, we, you know, we, they, they, um, the, the joke was they would sit by their phone waiting for it to ring when I was going to connect with them, you know? So like they're lame, but they're like my brothers. I've known a couple of them since second grade. And so, I can make the decision and say, you're not going to put anything into this relationship. Goodbye. As opposed to, I want you in my life. Right. So I have to do a hundred zero or 90, 10 to keep you in my life because you're lame. I'm cool with that. Right. right. And I'm going to, I'm going to joke about the fact that you're lame because I've known you since second grade, but I'm not holding it against you that you're lame. Right. Big difference. Yeah. Big difference. No, thanks for sharing that. And now tell us a little bit more before we end What's going on with the business? What are you working on now? What are you most excited about? Well, definitely the Titans of Direct Response. is yeah. the, it's, it's right in front of me. Um, I, I can't believe the people that have come out to speak. And a lot of it's because of Marty. Talk about contribution and things coming back. 
I mean, every person I asked, and these are all like the top guys in direct response marketing of the last 50 years, Dan Kennedy, Ken McCarthy, pioneer of the internet, my top copywriters who are responsible for those billions of pieces of direct mail, Paris Limpropolis, Arthur Johnson, David Deutsch, and Eric Betchel, Gary Bensavenga, Amer probably the best living copywriter in the world, Perry Marshall, one of the most incredibly admired marketers in the world, a little younger than some of the other guys too, Joe Sugarman, pioneer, Jay Abraham, who you mentioned, uh, Greg Ranker of Guthy Ranker, uh, little, little, little infomercial company, one point right. eight <laughs> billion, one one point eight billion dollars in revenue. Fred Katona, the number one radio guy, who Dan Kennedy said we should definitely get the best direct response radio guy, and then my own internal uh, mastermind group, which is Ryan Lee, Jim Quick, and Michael Fishman, titans of their own, and everybody. I, I didn't have to like get the words out of my mouth. Would you want to come speak at an event that honors Marty, that talks about the eternal truths of marketing? over the last 50 years and how, they're, how we're going to go forward, I don't care whether you're online or offline, and every one of them said yes. Yeah. Um, and it's this it's just a bit, it was this perfect storm after Marty passed away. Then, so I, I can't be more excited than, I mean, I'm excited about a lot of other things too, but nothing more exciting yeah. than that. And yeah. uh, that's, in, that's coming up in a little over a month. And uh, very, very excited about it. Still seats available. Um, it's going to be epic. The VIP yeah. sold out, but... Um, uh, we have, you know, it's two full days. All those people are speaking. Tons of giveaways. I mean, I've, I've created these because I think that you have to give people the stuff to walk away with, you know, the, the, the swipe files that I'm going to give away yeah. of, of, of the best mailing pieces we've ever done and the yeah. best, just great stuff for anybody who's in marketing. So, yeah, I'm not more, there's nothing I'm more excited about yeah. than that. I'm sure this will be, and I'm obviously going, I don't know why someone wouldn't go, Really, but um, and this is not a promotion. I oh. I just tell everyone about this because it is gonna be epic. Probably the the best event I've probably ever been to. I would I'm gonna guess. Um, and I'm sure every attendee that I've talked to, I know is going, could probably be a speaker also. Right. You know, really. Yeah. The titan. The t I say the titans in the audience. Yeah. Rival the titans on stage. Yeah. And I've I've seen the registration list. I mean, there are copywriters in the audience. People that I've hired that you know make millions as copywriters and marketers and yeah. some great online marketers too that are coming, which I'm really really pleased about. Like they, you know, the best online marketers today really understand that you know that they didn't in, the affiliate marketing. If you think that that wasn't invented by an internet marketer, we did endorse mail. You know, Reader's Digest did endorse mailings in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. Affiliate marketing. You know, this thing about Nate. What do they call it? Native advertising. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were, they're, they're advertorials. We were doing advertorials, you know, since the 1950s. So, I'm, and I'm not saying that what, what's being done today isn't great and it's state of the art and it's, you know, it's great stuff. But this idea that yeah. it was invented yeah. by internet marketers, yeah. no. Yeah. Now, a lot of the stuff is on steroids because of the technology, which is great. Right. But so, if you look at yeah, the orange origins of it, you can find that, and sometimes going to the source, you can find how powerful it is and take it, Taking a step forward. Right, and, yeah. and, and I think uh, John Carlton, I just posted on this last week, which you just, you know, I think my, my last, I, I called it the copywriter in the coal mine, yeah. and that the copywriters are still king for me. That great copy is great copy. You yeah. know, if you, if, I don't care whether you're online or offline. You write a great sales letter, Gary Halbert had the best line, the classic line, um, you know, every business problem can be solved with a great sales letter. <laughs> and if anybody who doesn't think that copy and creative is still ruling the day even when the technology seems to overshadow it i think is nuts yeah brent and i, I just wanted to thank you you know i feel like when we get on the line i say okay there's one or two questions i could probably do this for the next five hours <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah you don't want to do that you want you you got a job you got yeah you, you got to go uh, no i mean uh, this is absolute pleasure and i know Me you too. have a meeting so i want to respect your time but no but thank you so much uh, again for for joining me okay great thanks jeremy